so, hey, y'all mates, I don't know. I'm so glad to be here with you. We've been waiting and waiting and waiting for this wonderful time to be here with you, to get back in the household of faith here down under. What a great day. What a great hour to be together. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. I tell you, the Lord bless me. I, I just wanted to... There are so many things I want to say and want to go down so many paths. So you use your faith with me right now that I won't get distracted and head off down some place I shouldn't be. But in about 1997, I think, I was on my way to go pick my daughter up from cheerleading camp. Just minding my own business, listening to some cassette tape back then. Listening and all of a sudden I heard the Lord on the inside of me, not with my outside ears, but if it had been outside, it wouldn't have been any stronger than it was on the inside. And the Lord, it just seemed to me to be out of the blue. And he said, go to Australia and teach my people to pray. And I tell you, it was so strong. It was so strong, I felt like just pointing my car straight towards the Pacific and driving right on through. I, I mean, I, I don't even know how to make that happen or to get that done, but over the next two years, the Lord worked it out. I came to Australia several times, and you know, it's you guys are away from the house for me. It takes a while to get here, but we came several times, and in 1999, had the Spirit-Led Prayer Conference in Sydney. Did I have any folks in here that were with us during that conference there? I see hands going up. Yay, praise God. But I wanted to tell you this. So when we came in those... the those times through 1998 and preparing for the conference in 1999, I tell you, it just, I would be in prayer preparing for a service. And it, it was as if uh, the, the other uh, prayer leader that I had with me, and it was as if we were standing looking in a vast holding tank, like a, a big water tank or something. And it was, it was, like we were just looking down into it and it was empty. And we were praying in tongues as hard and fast as we could. We both, we talked about it. The people that were gathered in those little church meetings that we had in prayer, we were praying and praying and praying and praying because it felt at that time like there was such a spiritual deficit here of, of real praying in the spirit and praying by faith. But I don't think it's that way anymore. And all the times that I've been here since then, it's just escalated and escalated and escalated. And God has moved and he's been faithful to respond to those prayers. I know there were people praying, but it just seemed like God took it to another level. And in the last 20 years, 21 years since then, I know that the people in the body of Christ all over this great land have grown and grown and grown in faith, grown in the spirit, grown in prayer. And so I have the expectation that our times together over the next three days are going to be so productive beyond anything according to scripture that you could even dare ask or think because God is willing, God is ready. God's, God's been waiting for this moment more than you and I have been. Amen. Now, one thing that the Lord said impressed me with some years ago in preparing for another Spirit-led prayer conference. He seems to talk to me about those conferences. And, and he said, there's something about it. Now, remember, this is something the Lord said. This was, this was his impression. There's something about it when people who know how to use their faith, come together to pray. And when I first quoted that back to myself, I said, so there's something about it when people of faith come together to pray. And I thought, that's not right. That's not what he said. And I thought about it and went, wait a minute. What I heard was there's something about it when people who know how to use their faith come together to pray. It takes it to another level. There's, there's, we're, not, we're not here out of desperation. We're here out of purpose. We're, we're not here to beg. We're here to believe. We're, we're not here to question and to wonder. We're here to obey and to follow. 
and to give faith command where he tells us to give faith the command and to be uh, to humble ourselves under his mighty hand and his mighty direction and his mighty leadership with an expectation of a release of power because of faith that's released. And so everything that you hear this weekend, everything you hear Brother Copeland say or Brother Savell say, Pastor George, anyone else, all of it should feed into your faith for your prayer life as much as anything else. Never separate your prayer life from your faith life. Amen? So... So as I was thinking and praying in the last several days, spent a lot of time praying in tongues about tonight and where we would start, I went back to that very phrase, people come together who know how to use their faith. That's a picture of corporate prayer. And so I wanted to talk a little bit about corporate prayer because if we will pray with some uh, understanding from the word of God, our faith in our corporate prayer can come to another level and it will produce greater results. And I don't know about you, but I don't like to waste my time in prayer. How many of you just like to pray for no good reason? <laughs> Every time we come to a place of prayer, even whether it's to fellowship with the Lord or to worship the Lord or, or whatever the purpose might be, there should be some effect because you're coming before the throne of the Most High, the King of the universe, the Almighty God. And He's not changing, but coming into His presence should change you, circumstances, other people. It, 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 it should rock and roll everything because we come before Him and he is the great changer. So let's feed our faith on our corporate prayer tonight, and then we'll see where he takes us from there. Corporate prayer was very, very high in Jesus' priority and where prayer was concerned. In Luke chapter 11, and I read mostly from the Amplified Bible, not completely, but, but a lot. I like it. It has more words, and so do I, so we go together well. So in Luke chapter 11, very familiar verse to, to us. It says, he, Jesus, was praying in a certain place and he stopped. And one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples. And he said to them, so if you go on and read the rest of this chapter, there's a lot that Jesus said about prayer. He talks about intercession. He talks about relationship with uh, God in prayer. Talks about confession. Talks about forgiveness. Talks about fasting. So there's much he has to say about prayer. But where did he start? He started with corporate prayer. Now this prayer is not always, in fact, rarely recognized as corporate prayer. But he said, when he was teaching them, he said, when you pray, say, our Father. Did you ever notice that? Our Father. Even when we say that in our Western thinking, especially Americans, maybe not as much here, but I suspect in any of the Western society, we tend to be very self-aware, very me, very I. But he said, our Father. When we pray that prayer, e even when we're by ourselves, we, we say our Father, but we're thinking me. We're thinking my Father. Well, He is. Of course He is. And He was establishing a lot of things in this prayer, teaching them a lot of things. But what I want to point out to you was He said, our Father. And of course, it went on to say, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation. Deliver us from evil. And so he's speaking to this group of Jews and he's saying to them. So his first, first lesson for them in prayer, even as they watched him, as he said, get this right, about corporate prayer. They came to him as a group, said, teach us to pray. And so he did. And he had things he established in that prayer, but he said, do this together. Our Father. 
corporate prayer should always be so much more than just a, a group of people, a lot of people praying at once. And there's, a, there's something about that. There's a benefit to it, you know, when you walk in a room and, and you have the, the, the sense of a lot of people praying, especially among people like us that we, we pray out loud. And, and uh, somebody said, well, uh, you know, you shouldn't pray loud and say, well, why? God's not nervous, you know. I, I remember I grew up in a denominational church uh, when I was young, much younger, and boy, no, there was never a sound in there except when the deacons would say, amen. And that, I always looked forward to that little break, you know, <laughs> amen. But I loved it when we came over into the fullness of the Spirit where you could hear and sense and feel and, and have this awareness of the people around you. But corporate prayer has a higher level than just being together and praying individually while we're there. It's about more than praying by yourself with a lot of people. Did you get that? We just pray thinking about ourselves, listening to ourselves, pray one of us, sometimes not even listening to the person that's leading or not aware of the people around us. Maybe if it gets real loud, well, I'll get real loud too. And that's about all the effect maybe that corporate prayer can have, but it has so much more to offer than that. When you think about it, every time you pray, there are a lot of people praying at the same time. All around the globe, people are praying. And so God can, I had a Sunday school teacher one time. I wasn't in that little church very often, very long rather. But the Sunday school teacher, she said, all those, those Pentecostal people and they just all pray out loud. I don't know how God can answer any of it. <laughs> really? He would have a real problem with all the Chinese. Just think about all those people praying at one time. No. No, he, he's well able because he doesn't listen with an outer ear like we have. He listens with a discerning ear like Solomon asked for. So anytime we're pray, we pray, there are a lot of people praying at one time, but we're just praying by ourselves. Individual, individual prayer has its place. Individual prayer is essential. Individual prayer is called for and it has to be developed. Individual prayer, developing in your individual prayer has a huge impact on the corporate prayer, the supply you bring, what you bring to, to that corporate prayer together, but it's not always what's called for. Corporate prayer has a place, and there are some things by corporate prayer you can't get any other way. There are things in your own prayer life you can't get by yourself. God made it that way, and, and that's the way it, it is, whether, whether we favor that or not. That's the way he made it. Now let's think about this in corporate prayer for a minute. So when the church was launched, it was launched out of a place of corporate prayer. Did it begin in Acts chapter two? No, corporate prayer that launched the church began in Acts chapter one. Now we know that they were already born again because Jesus had come to them and he breathed on them and said, receive the, the Holy Ghost. And they, he breathed on them the same way God breathed on Adam. And they believed that he was raised from the dead. They believed that he was Lord. And so they were born again, but the church hadn't been launched. The church hadn't been moved forward. The church hadn't been, been anointed as a corporate body yet. And so Jesus told them in Acts chapter one, he said to them, now you go to Jerusalem and you wait there for the promise of the spirit. And that he, that was in verse four, he said, go wait for what the promise father promised, which you've heard me talk about it. And they didn't understand it when he talked about it before, but they said, Yes, sir, that's what we'll do. Now in verse 12, Acts chapter one, verse 12, the disciples went back to Jerusalem from the hill called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, only a Sabbath day's journey. And when they entered the city, they went up the stairs to the upper room where they were indefinitely staying. They planned on staying there. They went with purpose and we're not leaving. 
We're not, we are not giving up on this until we get what the father promised, even though they didn't know what that would look like. And it says there was Peter and John, James, Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew, James, son of Alphaeus, Simon the Zealot, Judas, the son of James. All of these with their minds in full agreement devoted themselves steadfastly to prayer, waiting together with the women. Now, who were the women? Now, why did they mention who the women were? Because there was this group of women in Luke chapter 8, you see them named or some of them are named. And it was a group of women that traveled with them, traveled with Jesus. They, they supplied out of their finances. Some of them were very well to do both. They had position in community. They had, their husbands had position in the government and they traveled with Jesus. They gave testimony to what that mean. They were part of the road crew. They were part of the team. And so those same women apparently were there of course, that makes sense. They were with them everywhere else they went. Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. So they had quite, quite a group of people. We know later, in this next verse says there was about 120. 120 people. I think that that's pretty close to the number of people that were traveling with him, between 70 and 100 people all the time traveling with him. What a group. So they were used to being together. They went up and it says that they had their minds made up and they devoted themselves to prayer. And then what happened? They were very mindful, being Jews, they were very mindful of this corporateness. Jews pray differently than Christians do in a number of ways, but one of the things is they are very aware of themselves as a nation. We should be aware of ourselves as a body. They, they recognize their individual responsibility. They under, under recognize their individual relationship with God, but they are very conscious of their, their national identity in God as well as their individual. We must be much more aware of our our identity in the body of Christ as the body of Christ and not just in our individual identity and not just in our family or our church or my group or my company or my denomination. But Paul said, he said, some of you are sick and have died because you're not, you're not aware of your place in the body and praying corporately, moving corporately, using your faith corporately. So they went up those stairs with the determined purpose that corporately they were going to receive what Jesus said was coming. They had full expectation that whatever comes for me is coming for Peter and James and Judas and Mary and Martha and all of the others that were there. They fully expected there to be a corporate receiving because there was a corporate praying. Now, doesn't that change, doesn't that broaden our expectation? And they also expected in their praying that it wasn't just for them, but that it would spill out beyond them because they were very aware of, of their national identity, their racial identity, uh, and not racial in the way that the rest of us would think as much as their, their, their uh, assignment from God to be a light to all the rest of the world. So they were very aware of that. Jesus had said to them, where two or more of you are gathered together, we quote it this way, where two or more of you are gathered together, there I am in the midst of them. But Jesus, when you think about what he said there, where two or more of you are gathered together, the I am is in the midst of you. Now, what happened when Moses fell in front of the I am? I mean, there, was, there, there were signs, wonders, miracles, power. The earth rocked and rolled and reeled under the power of it. Nations changed, borders changed, and a group of ragtag people came out, a nation under the mighty hand and power of God. Because the I am had come amongst them. 
Well, we have not only the I am in us, but when we come together in that place of corporate prayer, the I am is working among us. And we see they knew that. And so when they came together and began to pray and the appointed time came and they had prayed their way for 10 days, they prayed, prayed their way to the place. And when the day of Pentecost had fully come, what happened? happened? Well, there was, a, there was a mighty sound of a rushing, mighty wind blew in there and there was fire that fell. That same fire that sat on that bush suddenly wasn't on the bush. The I am was on them. And it got on them so strong, it came on them in such fire and in such power that it came out of them flowing in another tongue, opened the door of the supernatural and they walked through it over into the realm of the spirit in ways they had never seen or knew possible, walked out, fuck God on them, moved them out and the effect spread out on into the street and, and in a very hostile environment. The government was not for them. The religious leaders were not for them. The, the, the Hellenists were not for them in a horrible environment. And yet they boldly stood up and prayed and preached and prophesied. And 3,000 people were born again before the afternoon was over. And all of that out of that place of expectation in prayer, they knew that if we pray together, I am is here and I am showed up. They knew that what they asked for, they would receive. They knew that Jesus had promised. We, we, have, we have the authority of the word of God that whatsoever we ask the Father in his name, he will give it to us. So that's the platform on which we are going to take our praying time together going into this meeting. So what are we going to corporately pray for? Well, the first thing tonight, we're going to pray for Brother Copeland and we're going to pray for utterance that the Apostle Paul in more than one place said, pray for me that I have a freedom of utterance. Now real quick, we're laying a foundation tonight. Real quick, I want to tell you what freedom of utterance, what it looks like. Uh, in the, the Greek word that's translated utterance means divine expression. I had this so plain come up to me just here recently. I preached a message a year or so ago. I had the outline for it, but I really liked the way it, it came out. And I wanted, I was then needed to preach that same message to another group. So I went back and listened to myself, which I don't very often do. But I did, I listened to it and I filled in on my outline. The examples that I had, the, the it just, I mean, word for word, I laid it out and, and I was ready. I got up in front of this second group and I did not have the freedom of utterance that I had had in the first one, but I had the exact same amount of time, the exact same outline with the notes. And I, it was, I had just listened to that message. It was fresh in my mind. I was using the same words. It just was coming out the same way. And I would say there was uh, the three or four examples. I had no time to share. I felt that I wasn't getting the message across. Why? I didn't have the same level of divine expression. It's supernatural. It's supernatural to be able to say more in the same amount of time than another, another opportunity and not be able to say it with this, trying to use the same set of words. It was a divine expression. Why did I have a different level? Well, in one group, I was speaking to a little bit more advanced group. And they had their faith stirred. They were ready. They were believing. This uh, second time I spoke to a group, they were really young in the Lord. And I would say some of them weren't real sure what I was talking about. And so I didn't have, they weren't, they weren't believing. They weren't expecting. There hadn't been the kind of prayer believing for that divine expression. So we're going to take five minutes and stand here. and we're, Stand up, please. And we're going to pray for Brother Copeland, but we're going to set our faith together with that that one accord as we pray and pray in the spirit, just like the apostles and disciples did there in Acts chapter two. I'm gonna pray, I'll, I'll uh, um, 
pray and lead, but you set your faith to be agreeing with me, like Jesus said, you be agreeing as I'm praying. Don't just go off on your thing. Listen, and everything I say, you say, I agree with that. You pray in the spirit and add your faith to it. We're going to believe for that divine expression to flow freely here tonight. Do I get a witness with, from you? Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Glory to God. Praise the Lord. So Heavenly Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus. And just as you said, Jesus, just as you said, wherever two or more of you are gathered together in my name, I am is in the midst. We look to you, O oh great I am, the great God of miracles, the great God of power and might and strength, King of the universe, mighty God, and King of our hearts, lover of our souls, our Savior, our Redeemer, our, our soon coming King. We look to you and we're asking you, Father, in the name of Jesus for Brother Copeland for tonight and every service for Brother Savelle, Pastor George, for, for our musicians, Lord, for all of us that we would have that freedom of utterance, the divine expression to say as Jesus said, Lord, to be just as Jesus said, to say what we hear the Father say, to do what we see the Father do that there's expression to preach, boldness to speak, freedom of utterance to teach, freedom of utterance to deliver in the gifts of the Spirit, freedom of utterance to prophesy and to speak, Lord, freely. Go ahead, David. To speak freely in the, in the realm of the Spirit, to speak to this nation, to speak to wicked spirits, to speak to angels, to speak, Lord, to speak to circumstances, to speak in the name of Jesus with the authority of, of, of a prophet of God. Lord, we lift him up to you and we add our faith together for the anointing and the office of the prophet he's called to stand in. That Lord, he'll have words for this nation, words for the church, words that will change things, words that will alter situations, words that will change the strategies, the, the deceitfulness of the devil and cause his work to come to nothing than words, Lord, that will release the life, the power of the Almighty and the plan of God for this nation. We praise you, Lord, for how you brought this nation along. We praise you for how this nation and the outpouring of the Spirit that's happening across this nation. We praise you for it. We praise you for it. We praise you for it, Lord. We praise you, we praise you, we praise you, we praise you, we praise you. But now, Lord, we are asking that things move up in you, that, Lord, there be a greater rooting in the body of Christ, a greater working knowledge of working with you in the Word of God, how to stand by faith, how to live by faith, how to walk with God, how to face difficulties and circumstances, and to be victorious. Hallelujah. We thank you for that, Lord. We thank you, Lord. We thank you. We thank you that the church of the living God is growing up into Him. Growing up into Him. Growing up into Him. Hallelujah. And we claim, Father, in Jesus' name, that all of us here, this whole weekend that we will have ears to hear. We will hear, we will hear, we will hear. And we thank you, Father, we, just, we decide even as the apostles did, we, we cause our thinking to be focused, our minds to be set. And we are determined, Lord, to not be restless, but to listen to every word that's spoken and to feed on the word of God, that it be rooted in us. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, <coughs> we give you praise. 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 